And now please join me in welcoming Nancy Naomi Carlson from our sponsor for this translation event, Alta. Nancy? Thank you, Carrie. On behalf of the American Literary Translators Association, better known as Alta, I'd like to welcome you to the Alta panel on literary translation. Alta is delighted to be partnering with World Literature Today as we share many similar goals. Alta's mission is to support the work of literary translators, advance the art of literary translation, and serve translators and the students, teachers, publishers, and readers of literature in translation. Founded in 1978, Alta is a nonprofit arts membership association that holds an annual conference each year, bringing together translators, writers, and editors from all over the country and around the world. And this year's first ever virtual conference was just held in the past two and a half weeks with over 600 folks in attendance from all over the world. In addition, Alta administers prizes, fellowships, and mentorships to recognize excellence in literary translation, including the National Translation Awards in Poetry and Prose. You can learn more about Alta on our website, www.literarytranslators.org, and I'll put that in the chat box, or get in touch with us on social media at Lit Translate on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I am very, very pleased to introduce the moderator for this very exciting panel, Will Evans. Will Evans is a publisher, translator, entrepreneur, and founder of Deep Bellum Publishing, a nonprofit indie book publisher dedicated to translating the wor world's best novels into English for American audiences. Evans also founded Deep Vellum Books in early 2016, a brick and mortar bookstore and community center in Dallas's historic Deep Ellum neighborhood. I've been there. Evans earned two Bachelor of Arts degrees from Emory University in history and Russian language and culture. He also received a Master of Arts in Russian culture from Duke University. Last night, Deep Vellum launched the 50th anniversary Newstad anthology, Dispatches from the Republic of Letters, under its imprint, Phoneme Media. And you can see it up there. And we are fortunate to have both Will with us today, as well as David Shook, Phoneme's founder. Thank you, Will and David, for your visionary work in the field of literary translation. Thank you so much, Nancy Naomi. Thank you, Alta, for hosting and sponsoring this panel. Uh, thank you to the New Stop Prize, World Literature Today, and everyone at the University of Oklahoma. And especially thank you, um, anyone who is out there in the world, listening in and watching right now. A lot of folks in Oklahoma, California, Massachusetts. Did I see Exeter? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for caring about translations and translated literature broadly. Uh, I am asked to be the moderator of this because I'm like you. I love translations. I love translated literature and translators have enriched my life. And once upon a time, I put my uh, Russian dictionary to good use and I attempted to translate a novel, which was really fun and made me realize that perhaps I should be a publisher instead and lift up the great work of the truly talented literary artists that we can call literary translators. And uh, it is through the great work of Alta that I felt bold enough to even think I could start a publishing house in the 21st century, uh, an indie publishing house in Dallas, Texas, of all places. But uh, it's through the great work of that membership organization, I met so many amazing people translating from so many languages that I had read and so many I had not yet at the time, and that I was able to get the resources needed to find some of those books so the Deep Vellum could make crazy claims like we publish some of the greatest authors in the world and to give us enough resources to publish an amazing book like Dispatches from the Republic of Letters, which is out officially today, a beautiful hardcover book celebrating 50 years of the New Stock Prize and it has a ribbon. So in case you like hardcover books with a ribbon, 
anyone who joined the panel last night, you know, I'm very proud of this ribbon and it's not enough. We don't get enough ribbons in our books these days unless they're like the modern library editions. So I think we should celebrate it. But all of this is to say that introduction was lovely. My bio was lovely, but we are joined today by four of the greatest translators working in the English language. And it is my goal to sit back and listen as much as possible. With that said, please do drop into the chat box any questions you may have that I can pass along to the panelists during this presentation. Um, I'll work in all the best ones. So ask anything you've ever wanted to know about how these amazing translators who work in so many different spheres from so many different languages, what brings them all together, what unites them, and then what maybe makes them all a little bit different. I hope we can dig into that. I hope we can come up with some good controversy together, which is always a lot of fun. And uh, it goes without saying that I want to thank you again for joining us, because without you, everything that we do as publishers and as translators and as writers, uh, it wouldn't be possible. So thank you to the readers uh, from Venezuela, I'm noticing in the chat box. Thank you to those who are joining us in Texas and everywhere in between. Um, Instead of reading every panelist's bio, which is on the Newstat website, which is how you logged in, please go read their amazing bios because every single one of these panelists is truly an extraordinary person. And I have a personal story about all of them. And so I hope I can work it in. Uh, here is a very short intro about all of them. But once upon a time when I was getting a master's degree in Russian culture, um, I started translating a Russian novel and my professor at the time, Dr. Carol Apollonio said, you know, maybe we should do a class on Russian literary translation here at school. And we did, it was the first time there had been a class at Duke on translation in that time in like 10 or 15 years. But the text that, that had just come out that we used as our guiding principle for the entire course was David Bellos's Is That a Fish in Your Ear? Which for those who haven't read it yet <clears throat> is quite possibly the most accessible and fun introduction to the field of literary translation, it is, it's a joy. It's as much a joy to read as it is to actually translate. You know, you, you get to live inside someone's head and have a blast, just like uh, it wouldn't be possible otherwise. And then Peter Constantine, whose work I have read in so many different languages, which is truly extraordinary. Uh, he translates from Russian, which thank you, Peter, um, for all that you've brought my life, but also the essays that he's written for organizations like Words Without Borders about sort of diasporic language, which is a really beautiful and I've, I've learned so much from. David Shook, uh, whom I consider uh, one of my, my great collaborators ever since I founded Deep Vellum. They founded Phoneme Media around the same time with a very complimentary mission. And we've since joined forces and Phoneme is now an imprint of Deep Vellum. And it's a true joy to publish works from languages and countries around the world uh, that are a blast like this one that's just coming out from Deep Vellum. This one is called Red Ants. It's the first book ever written in Sierra Zapotec translated into English. Uh, a true joy to know you, David. You've brought so much to the world. And Alana Marie Levinson Labrosse, you are an amazing translator of Kurdish. And I wish I had my copy of Dictionary of Midnight here at hand by the great Kurdish poet, Abdullah Pashu. We were able to publish that at the end of last year. All four of these panelists, truly extraordinary. And so we're gonna do a short bit uh, where each panelist introduces themselves. Um, and then from there, we'll go more into the Q&A. So without further ado, I'm gonna mute myself, drop questions into the chat box. Chat box. Если говорите по-русски, потом пишите мне, пожалуйста, по чату. Давай. And let's have some fun, everyone. Um, and without any further ado, David Bellows, take it away, my friend. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Фадим Дерит. The advertised... Um, am I unmuted? Are you hearing me? Okay. The advertised title uh, for this session is um, Why Translation Matters. And so uh, that's my topic. And I'm going to say some things that I, I guess all of you know, but it feels to me need saying again and again. Because I mean, what's significant about that question, why translation matters, is not the answer you might give to it, but the very fact that it's being asked. I mean, uh, in the pretty little town of Tartu in Estonia, asking that question would likely cause a loud guffaw. I mean, if there were no translation, students at the ancient university uh, of that city 
would have to do without Euclid, without Aristotle, Descartes, Newton, Darwin, Freud, Marx. They'd have no access to foundational works in astronomy, chemistry, biology, botany, down to zoology. They wouldn't know the periodic table and they wouldn't have anything to watch on Netflix either. I mean, what a silly question, they would say. Estonian culture is rich and vibrant, thank you very much, but without translation. Even the Estonians who invented Skype would have had nothing to give back to the world. The same is true even in Paris, where these issues are often viewed through rather thick blinkers. But whatever the Académie Française may say, French scientists, philosophers, writers and film buffs would not have got very far in the world if they hadn't read Euclid and Newton and Darwin or Dostoevsky and had never uh, watched the subtitles to view Bergman and Kurosawa and the early Polanski and Istvan Sabo and Fellini and Antonioni and so on. And they also would have a pretty thin time deciding what to watch on Netflix. There is perhaps one, oh, there is not perhaps, there, there is one large exception uh, to the rule of translation as the principal vector of knowledge, culture, information, and entertainment, uh, and that is India. Um, India does not have a strong or long tradition of translation. But there's a reason. Indian citizens are at least bilingual. I mean, all of them. The vast majority of them have three languages, and very many of them can access books, movies, people, knowledge, and newspapers in four, five, or six languages. Now, one of those languages of wide circulation in India is, of course, Indian English. But it's worth noting that the uh, many, many books published in India in English uh, are not circulated outside of India, and we're still very short of translations from Indian English to American or international English. Um, and, and they're not distributed outside of India either. So that's something of an exception. But everywhere else in the world, translation matters. I mean, even in the USA, which is perhaps the only place in the world where the question can be asked without arousing puzzlement, laughter, despair, or scorn. Now, I know we're going to talk about literary translation mostly, so I'm going to stick my neck out and say that literary translation doesn't actually matter more than any other kind. <clears throat> I mean, translation matters for the New York Times, which would hardly be the journal that it is if it only contained matter sourced from English language uh, sources. I mean, how could it possibly cover COVID in France or the economy of Japan or the politics of Bolivia or oppression in Myanmar uh, or disputed elections in Belarus or the quality of life in Denmark if it didn't use material translated from French, Japanese, Spanish, Burmese, Belarusian and Danish? I mean, the journal would shrink to less than half its current size and it would quite frankly become useless as a medium of information and comment and we'd probably stop reading it anyway. I mean, translation matters also for economists who have to read Marx if only to find him wanting. And it matters for psychologists who surely must read Piaget as well as Freud. It matters for mathematicians who not only need to know their Euclid but their Euler and their Mandelbrot too. Uh, translation matters simply for everyone. Um, it, it, it's everywhere. Uh, it is used by, I think, every individual on this planet, and especially by those conservative evangelicals who look to the Bible for guidance, a, a book that has only ever existed in translation since the Gospels uh, were written in Koine Greek, but manifestly based on stories, legends, and fragments in Aramaic, which we have lost, so we only have the translation. <coughs> so, the fact that this question is being asked as a title for a panel um, suggests something quite extraordinary uh, 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 historically unprecedented since the time of the ancient Greeks. Now, the Athenians of the classical era did not translate. Their one great flaw. They considered that anything said in not Greek was not interesting or that if not Greek speakers had anything interesting to say, well, they could jolly well learn Greek in order to say it. This willful self-isolation from what the Greeks called 
varvaros, yeah, that's our word barbarian, yeah, and it's based on the idea that the sounds they made were just like the barking of dogs, va va va, um, uh, has not been replicated anywhere ever since, as far as I know, not even in Edo, Japan, where translation to and from Chinese was a necessary part of the education of the elite. So just asking the question as to why translation matters suggests, I fear, that we are on the brink of returning to the inward looking, self-isolating, mindless self-regard of the men who had so Socrates drink hemlock. The Greeks, however, did have a stroke of luck. Uh, the Romans decided to translate Greek literature into Latin in order to found their own literature. Um, that's what saved Aeschylus and Sophocles from oblivion. Then the Greeks had a second stroke of luck, a quite extraordinary stroke of luck, when Severus Sebocht, uh, um, a Syriac bishop in the first millennium CE, uh, uh, with an act of extraordinary generosity, uh, translated um, Greek philosophy, uh, medicine and mathematics into Syriac. Without that act of generosity, we would not know a thing about Aristotle or Galen or Euclid, Euclid or Pythagoras. Now the Greeks may not have wanted to know this, but what they did to the cultures that preceded them, that's to say, not translate them, could easily have happened to the Greeks themselves and left them as unconnected and unknown as the Sumerians, Akkadians, Hittites, Persians, Trojans, Elamites, and who knows what else. And the fact is we do not know what else precisely because they were not translated. Um, translation actually has mattered mightily even for the Greeks because it is only through translation that their intellectual and cultural endeavors have fertilized minds the world over for 2000 years and more. So let me just say the obvious again. I mean, translation matters because it is the tool, the mechanism of civilization in its broadest sense. It is also the obligatory tool for the survival of a civilization. Now, some of our compatriots may think that the empire of English is eternal. Unfortunately, there is nothing in the historical record to support that view. If the empire of English is not in constant interchange with other languages and cultures, if it cuts itself off by not even bothering to translate things said or written in not English, then as sure uh, uh, as can be, it will shrink and wither and fall away. And we'll have to rely on the off chance of a modern day Severus Sebokt to save our culture, science and thought from the fate of the Gauls, the Goths, the Medes and the Trojans. Okay, so that's why translation matters. In addition, it allows us to read the novels of Ismail Kadare, but that's something we're gonna be talking about later on this afternoon. Thank you. Um, thank you, David, that was amazing. And it goes without saying that, uh... I couldn't do without translation. And it's so important to put this in context about why it all matters. Uh, up next, Peter Constantine. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, David. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much, David. I, I also wanted to say that where I come from, which is Greece, uh, our language once ruled the world. Uh, it was the international tongue. And, and now it is a language that uh, that is, uh, um, spoken in Greece and in the diaspora, but it is, it is no longer spoken in the entire world and the entire world was from uh, north of Albania through Greece into India, whatever, um, um, whatever Alexander the Great had conquered. Uh, I, I want to, to say a few things about why translation matters and also, also expand a little bit on, on what David said from our, our own Balkan perspective. And that is that, um, I, I grew up in a, in a place in Greece where a sister language of, of Albanian was spoken. That was also my introduction to Albanian. And uh, we didn't know it was a sister language of Albanian until, uh, the, uh, uh, after, until the early 90s, 
when Albania was completely locked off to the world, what we thought is that we are speaking a language that is uh, Pelasgian, an ancient First Nation language of Greece. Uh, and Greece has quite a few uh, unknown languages. I mean, languages that are, that are um, um, octochthonous, that were born in Greece, but are not uh, languages that, that, that have been accepted or, or, or have been uh, put to writing. Anyway, our language is called Arberisht and uh, spoken in Corinth. And uh, also connecting to what David said, if we didn't translate, and I'm currently translating some of our village epics and, uh, and poetry into English, but if I didn't do that, it is a language that when I was young was spoken by all generations. Uh, my step-grandmother couldn't really speak Greek. We had to speak Alberish to her. Um, but now it is not really spoken anymore. I'm sort of pretty much one of the last people I go to the village and we basically speak Greek at that point. So that's another thing like being, uh, you know, uh, speaking a language, let's say that has very, very few speakers as in maybe at some point only one or two, uh, while you can still translate, you should probably do so because it does matter. I want to uh, bring in uh, uh, Ismail Kadare and his ideas on translation. He said something that I found very useful, both as a translator of uh, Ismail Kadare, I've translated uh, one of his books and some of his short stories, uh, Elegy for Kosovo, um, published in Britain as three elegies for Kosovo and uh, some, some short stories. But um, in an interview with uh, Jack Marinai in uh, 2008, he spoke about translating Greek again, which is very close to my heart. And uh, those of you who've read uh, Kadare will know that, that the whole Balkan reality that reaches straight back to Homer and even beyond is part of, of, of uh, Kadare's uh, uh, intellectual and, um, and creative territory. So what he said, in a translation or rather retranslation that served as a kind of a personal challenge was Aeschylus or Estia, or Arestia as we say in Greek. I tried to challenge both myself and the Albanian language regarding whether I would be able to preserve in the translation its two defining characteristics. The first consisted of a set of imposing verse lines constructed with equally imposing composites of two or three words, which as Aeschylus contemporaries used to argue, he employed to intimidate his audience. So what Cadere said next, I thought was particularly revealing. The other challenge was to preserve the nebulous saturation, the darker parts of many of Aeschylus's verses that are not rationally explicable. It sometimes seems as if the translator's job is to explain the literary work. But I think that uh, the translator ought to not only retain the clarity, but also loyally transmit ambiguities and uncertainties. And I think that is very, very useful in general, as we think about translation, you know, whether we're translation, translating uh, Russian classics, modern, modern pieces, particularly when we translate Cadere, because he is an author who is a master in his style of, of ambiguity, uncertainty. Of course, that was a way one had to write when one was living during the, the, the oppressive communist regime. But if you wanted to, to slip through the censor, you had to be an, uh, uh, ambiguous, you had to be uncertain. And yet he also managed to be extremely direct and actually say things how they are. So, so that is something that has really fascinated me as well. And I was very happy to see in the interview, uh, uh, Ismail Kadare actually say those words. And um, what he also said that he considers uh, the works that he translates as guests in his own home, which is the highest honor an Albanian can grant someone. And since they were guests in my studio, they were also guests in the Albanian language. And I've tested myself as well as the ability of the Albanian language to play host to foreign friends. So that is uh, Kadare's very generous uh, statement on, on, uh, um, on, on how he translates and how he perceives the work that he himself as a translator brings into the Albanian language. So um, 
One thing that, that I find interesting, maybe we can also talk in the discussion, is in, in my translations, when we translate from other worlds, and when I say other worlds, I, I mean that in a very specific way. Let's say the world of, in Three Elegies of Kosovo, it is the world of 1389, the Battle of Kosovo, where the history books are all contradicting one another. And yet, Kadere does have a, a very specific message in his, in his work. Uh, so how, do you, how do you recreate that world of minstrels and, and fanfare? Um, that's one question. The other question is, of course, in my, in my sister project, because I'm currently translating um, two books. Three Elegies for Kosovo was done about 20 years ago. Currently, I'm translating Spiritus, which is uh, another novel by Ismail Kadare, in which uh, a, a group of ethnologues enter very cold and, and dark Albania after the fall of, of the oppressive Hoxha re regime, looking for the spiritus, the spirit of communism. So trying to capture that, bringing it into an English reality, into a, uh, let's say New York, maybe, publish it to a New York publishing house, a readership uh, in America, in Britain today, 2020, in our, in our condition, that can look back and understand this, 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 uh, this other world, or, in my other um, uh, projects, translating from Arberisht, the village epics, where, where everything is very, very strange. Characters change sex, the prince wants to marry. This man he's fallen in love with, the man turns out to be a woman, thank God, now they can marry. So this whole situation that is meant in a very specific way and read and heard in a very specific way in a Corinthian village in the mountains, but comes across in a very, very different way. Um, in in uh, when you translate that into English, so th those were some of my initial thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and and I hope in in discussion, uh, if there's any, anything that we can talk about more specifically, that will be a very good thing. Another fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Peter. I absolutely love that. And we're going to go next to another wonderful presenter, Solana Marie Levinson Labrosse. Thank you so much, Peter. Hi, all. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This is such an exciting group to be a part of, such an exciting festival to be a part of. Um, and I'll be saying more about all the wonderful ways in which the University of Oklahoma and world literature today have been supportive of all of the, the reasons why I think translation matters. Um, yesterday in, in the panel launching the, the book Dispatches from the Republic of Letters, which is so beautiful and important, celebrating 50 years of the Neustadt Prize and Festival, someone asked the question, why have this kind of prize in a flyover state? And I've been thinking about that term flyover since that question from the participant. And I've actually, I've actually sort of started laughing to myself about, you know, how perfect it is to have a prize like this that's meant for flyover languages and literatures delivered by a flyover state, a university in what's considered a flyover state. Um, it, the technical term for these languages or flyover literatures is underrepresented. And I translate from one of those, I translate from Kurdish, um, which is, it has more speakers than Abrecht uh, um, at 40 million speakers, but those speakers are, are all stateless um, and considered political threats by the nations who host them. And, and as people are considered threats, so is their language. Um, so it's interesting to be speaking about why translation matters from the perspective of one of those flyover languages, one of those terrifically underrepresented languages. Um, the question to me isn't what translation can do or why does translation matter, but what can't it do? What doesn't it do? How could it possibly be irrelevant? Um, so David, I was really happy to hear you start us off with such a perfect, um, such a perfect introduction, staking that claim. Um, those are really big questions um, that I'd like to approach from a more intimate level, a more human level. When I moved to Kurdistan in 2011, to become a professor at the American University of Iraq, Sleimani. I didn't speak a word of Kurdish. And when I met my students at the undergraduate level, all of them were English language learners, very much similar to the Indian context that David um, outlined. 
all of them are at least bilingual, normally speaking more, more like uh, three or four or five languages. Um, and that teaching context has some interesting challenges. The first is, um, you know, obviously how do I get them to keep caring about their fluency in English? Um, but also more importantly, as, as students who are at the American University speaking English, um, where the American presence is, is at best fraught, um, uh, and English is, is a language of colonialism and conflict um, ever since the nation's founding in Iraq. How do we get, how do we get these students to see speaking English and the tension that that brings with it, politically speaking, personally speaking for them, how do we get them to see those tensions as something positive, constructive, transformative? Um, and that's something I've seen translation do for these students. Um, not only is it a pedagogically wonderful tool to get them caring about the minute elements of English, but it's a way for them to transform tensions that are quite divisive in their life into something that's quite cohesive. Um, something that doesn't make their world smaller, but makes it significantly bigger and gives them a way to make the world bigger for others around them. Um, we talk about translation giving texts a new life with new readership, but that new life also happens for translators, the way they see themselves, the way they see the original text. Um, I was visiting the Baghdad Museum a couple of years ago and um, was approached by a group of off-duty soldiers who were quite, quite imposing. And um, I wasn't sure what they wanted because my Arabic is, is not wonderful. And, um, and eventually we found, we found some translation, we were able to talk and they were very confused as to why I would come so very far to visit their museum. And I laughed because to me, it was so obvious that it was an amazing museum. I had just been marveling the entire time. But I also then immediately recognized, you know, the same thing is true. It took me, I grew up in San Francisco, but it took me until I was in my early twenties to go to Alcatraz Island. Sometimes it's the things that are closest to us that are hardest to see, hardest to appreciate, hardest to value. And translation gives us a way to see ourselves, to see these texts that we've found so familiar to us from completely new angles to value them very differently and to value ourselves very differently. Um, I worked with two emerging translators in Iraq, people who were not translators when we met, although when we met, I wasn't a translator either. Um, and people with whom I grew up as a translator, um, one of whom is with us today, Shani Mohammed is with us today. Um, and I have seen how translation helped us see ourselves and gave us a new sense of what we wanted our life to be. After working with Shene, I went on to a PhD in Kurdish literature. Um, Shene went on to a fully funded MFA in literary translation at the University of Iowa. Um, so these, this ability that we have from translating from ourselves and to see ourselves more clearly, to see these um, amazing texts that we've perhaps grown up with more clearly as well. That's a real new life, not just for the text, but for everything around the text, for everyone around the text. The other thing that I've seen translation do um, comes from how I came to translation. When I moved to Kurdistan, I didn't speak a word of Kurdish. And uh, I say Kurdistan, uh, that's a, a loose term for the, the lands where Kurdish people live. Um, it was yeah, officially politically Iraq. Um, and when I moved to Sleimani, the city that I, that I moved to, I didn't speak a word of Kurdish and the literature I found was largely untranslated. I was very excited to see it translated, um, but mostly I hadn't thought about translating it. I just wanted to read it. I wanted to understand what was forming the culture of the people I was with and literature was a, a large part of that. And so when I first started translating, I didn't set out to publish. Um, you know, David, you asked the question, does translation matter if no one reads it? Um, I would say, yes, it matters. That a lot of translation that I've done is yet to be published. And it matters to me and to the people I've done it with because it um, changed how we could see each other um, and changed 
changed how we could see our environment. Um, hopefully we bring that change to the rest of the world very soon, um, but it still matters not having reached that readership. And what we found was that as we were translating together just to read the poetry, we were actually creating these things that, that could matter to others, David, exactly as you mentioned. And, and in publishing those translations as co-translations, which has a very complicated history, a very complicated present, um, we were actually all raising each other up by credentialing ourselves equally at the same time we were all preparing ourselves for the next step. So for me, that was a PhD. For Shene, that was a master's degree, but I'm almost positive she'll go on to a PhD. For one of the people I worked with as a co-translator, who's also here with us today, Briar, um, he started out getting his master's degree and is now doing his own PhD. Um, all of us were raised up by, by translating together, truly collaboratively, and by publishing that way. Um, and that's actually something that WLT, that World Literature Today helped us a lot with, that Alta has helped us a lot with. And I just wanna take two seconds to, to thank them both for their support of emerging translators from their support of these flyover language literatures. Um, what we're doing when we translate collaboratively, when we publish collaboratively equally, is we are radically inverting certain power dynamics between the flyovers and the not flyovers, the English empire and the not English empire. And we are looking at the colonialist, sometimes racist impulses um, to call our co-translators or even relegate our co-translators um, to the space of language expert or native informant. I mean, already that term is so terrible. It should tip us off that there's something not right care. Um, but these terms, that space, they dehumanize the people we work with. Um, and they also relegate, relegate the people we work with to, to not being able to grow with us, to not being able to get better with us, to not being able to, to step into a space where they're speaking for themselves and speaking beside everyone else as a part of the global conversation. Um, essentially, we're taking people who without, without whom we would not be able to do our work and turning them into dictionaries with legs. Um, not doing that, honoring each other in the work, true collaboration, true co-translation um, has allowed all of us to work at incredible pace, at incredible volume and with incredible joy. Um, Kashkul, the organization that, that I founded with these co-translators of mine, has published over, uh, over half a dozen books. We've had over 100 magazine publications, and we have over 400 pages of yet, yet to be published work. Um, and that's all just in the last three years, uh, with only about a half a, dozen, half a dozen people working at the organization. In addition to that, all of, all of the, what we call principal investigators at Kashkul have gone on to fully funded graduate work. Um, not all of them in translation, some in creative writing, um, some in Islamic ethics, some in Middle East studies, but all of them have gone on to their, own, to their own studies. Again, proving that translation causes new life, not just for the text, um, excuse me, but for exciting. So thank you all for asking the question as silly as we may, as silly as we may hope it is, um, gives us a chance to talk like this. Thank you so much, Alana. This is such a beautiful presentation. I'll never forget my very first translation. I had a, a very, my best friend in Russia helped me a lot with the translation. We talked about it being a co-translation and not, well, first off, we never thought it would be published. And then when it did, uh, he just got a little credit in the book. And you know, I wish now his name was on the cover because Pasha could have used that. He's amazing. And I discovered more about the language via that, you know, was able to unpack more. And that's just such a beautiful thing. I love collaboration and I love collaboration and translation. So thank you for bringing up these power dynamics and the collaborative power and potential of translation. Thank you, Alana. 
David Shook, we'd love to hear from you. The last presenter to uh, do a presentation before we get to Q&A. So a reminder, uh, Lisa Stewart just dropped a question in the chat box. But if you hear anything and you will have a question for any of the presenters um, or for the entire panel, please drop it in the chat box. Thank you, David Shook. Thank you, Will, for your enthusiasm, as always. And thank you, David, Peter, and Alana, for your wonderful presentations. And thank you to Alta and World Literature Today and the Neustadt family as well. It's really great to be a part of this panel. And I was thinking about the question, why does translation matter? I was drawn to a few of my own experiences, both as a translator myself, primarily from Spanish, but also from a few indigenous Mexican languages in collaboration with their poets, and my experience as the publisher of, of Phony Media, which has focused on a lot of underrepresented languages, including publishing the first ever book-length literary translation from the Uyghur, for example and the first literary translation from the Lingala from Democratic Republic of the Congo. All of those, uh, by the way, available at Deep Vellum's website. And one of the first, first memories that came to me was a tour I did in 2010 with one of the first poets I ever translated, an Isthmus Zapotec poet from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Southern Oaxaca, Mexico. His name is Victor Teran, and he speaks and writes in a language that has about 100,000 speakers. And for its size, it actually has a, a tremendous literary history, a couple hundred years of, of novels and poetry in written form, as well as a very rich oral tradition. And Victor and I were invited to the UK by the Poetry Translation Center, which was founded by my mentor, Sarah McGuire, as part of a celebration of the Mexican Revolution Centennial. And we were there with two other prominent Mexican poets. And as we toured the country, I got to see how translation into English of Victor's work was for him a great validation of what he was doing. And as a writer in a minority language, and in, I would certainly argue, an oppressed language, I think it, it was a rare opportunity to escape the confines of, of Spanish language literary culture that didn't respect or really even read Victor's work or the work of so many indigenous Mexican writers. Though, of course, the opposite is certainly not true as Victor and his contemporaries are very familiar with contemporary Spanish language literature. And as we toured the UK, we, we sold out of the books. It, it was remarkable to see people's faces, to watch the audience's faces as they heard Isma Zapotec spoken aloud. Many of them did not know that that there were so many languages in Mexico besides Spanish. I went to visit Victor in Juchitan about a year later, and he treated me to a very special meal of iguana cooked in a sauce with its own eggs, uh, dehydrated shark salad, uh, turtle eggs, which look kind of like uh, sunken ping pong balls, and a few other, oh, armadillo, armadillo. That was the... Uh, the real highlight for me actually. It, uh, it's kind of a little gamey, but not too bad. And one of the things that most delighted me on that visit to Huchitan was seeing that the book that had sold out in the UK had been pirated in Huchitan and was being distributed quite widely. I, I'm pretty sure Victor had something to do with this pirated edition, but I, I asked him about it and he told me that the people of Huchitan saw this book, even though they couldn't speak English, as an incredible validation of their culture and of their literature. And really in a, a culture 
and in a language with, with so few speakers, that kind of validation and that kind of pride is so important because the language is always so close to, to extinction. It only takes a couple generations. And Victor has argued, and, and I think he's right, that translation is a key part of keeping the Zapotec language not just vital, as, as we've seen in English and other larger languages, but also in, in keeping it alive, keeping it spoken, encouraging young people to keep, keep reading, keep writing, keep producing culture. Today, there are several young rap groups in Huchitan who rap in Isthmus Zapotec. And I think that comes, for example, from, from the rich literary tradition that has preceded them. Victor himself has translated hundreds of world poets into Zapotec, often through Spanish as an intermediary, as that's what he has access to. And I must say, until you have heard E.E. E. Cummings in Isthmus Zapotec, I'm not sure you've heard E.E. E. Cummings at all. I'm actually going to drop a link to a video I made at Venice Beach of Victor reading one of his translations of E.E. E. Cummings into the chat here for everyone to watch after the panel. And He's also translated Wordsworth and, and told me once, um, actually at, at Wordsworth's house in Grasmere, the challenge of, of inventing a new flower name for the daffodil, which doesn't exist in, in Oaxaca. One other story I, I recalled had to do with, with that book, Uyghurland, which is written by the, the exiled Uyghur poet, Ahmad John Osman and translated by Jeffrey Yang, a great American poet and translator in collaboration with Ahmad John. That was one of the first books of poetry, I think the third book of poetry that Phoneme published. And it's a book I'm still, still very proud of. I recall a, a conversation that was incredibly meaningful to me and, and one that I still think of often with a young Kurdish refugee in Los Angeles, a woman who, who told me that the book had affirmed to her that she had a voice as a refugee that deserved to be heard, that she deserved to take up space, and that literature could, could be a medium for expressing that experience. And Clara is actually here today uh, in, this, in this panel discussion. Hello, Clara. And I, I asked her if I, if I remembered this story correctly in the chat earlier when I saw she was here. And, and she put her reflections on Uyghurland in such beautiful language. I, I just wanted to read it. She said that the book helped affirm the epistemic credibility of a marginalized tongue like my own that is often erased in dominant cultures. And of course, that's, that's the work of translation. That's the work of literary translation right there. And that is one of the things I'm very proud of of having done at Phoneme and, and with Will at Deep Vellum. We've recently published Alana's translations from the Kurdish, for example. Will just showed you that book by Pergentino Jose, a Sierra Zapotec writer who's also perhaps the greatest proponent of the Zapotec haiku. And many other, many other books like that. Poetry from Mongolian, for example. A lot of great stuff. So the other thing I think, you know, I, I think poetry in translation and, and in literary translation in general helps people feel seen, feel heard. And, and I think it can help humanize others. And I've been thinking of my own work as, as a translator in collaboration with some of the 
people I've worked with in recent years. And I think of World Literature Today having published special selections of literature from places like Equatorial Guinea and Bangladesh that I've edited. I think of, of some of the special features I've done for Words Without Borders featuring literature from Burundi during the political upheaval of 2015. And more recently of the translations I've done of poetry from Rojava from Northeastern Syria following the US withdrawal from the region. And I was at that time in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, where I was for about two years. And I'd begun collaborating, uh, just like Alana described, with, with several co-translators, including Jiar, Omer, Zidane Khalef, Pishtiwan Kamal, and Briar Bajalan, several of whose translations have since been published in World Literature Today and other magazines. And as we saw what was happening in, in neighboring Syria, and as we were awaiting the worst, as Turkey was beginning to invade and endanger the ordinary citizens of this place, we, we felt pretty helpless and we wondered what we could do. And eventually we came to the conclusion that, that our role, as small as it might be, and what was happening would be to use literary translation as a way to humanize the people of the region. You know, people who, who we stereotype as great fighters or allies in the battle against the Islamic State, but not much else. And literary translation, I think, is a great way to connect people across cultures, to humanize people who we, we don't understand or don't even have a, a basic groundwork to, to understand each other. So those are some of my, my personal experiences in terms of what literary translation can do and why it matters. Thank you so much, David. Um, I think one of my favorite things about translation is something you brought up sort of incidentally there. And how many of us who are working in this field, whether it's as a publisher, a translator, an editor, have heard the term asked of us, uh, yes, but isn't something lost in translation? And we can all deal with that question in a lot of different ways, but you brought it up very well in that through translation, someone like Victor can add new words to the language. You can enrich your own world through the reading of other worlds. You can add new words, new concepts, new facts to your own understanding of the world around you. And so, um, of course, something may be lost in translation, but certainly uh, I focus on what is gained um, and it is uh, what pushes me forward to keep finding new books as a, as a publisher and also as a reader um, to find things that will continue to um, round out sort of this, this understanding of this world around us. And so thank you so much for that, that beautiful talk, David. Um, I, I wanted to sort of open things up first um, by, by calling on David Bellows, who had an idea. Um, I wanted to respond to something that Peter Constantine said, and I think it actually is a nice launching off point because it's about Cadere, who is the New Stop Prize laureate that we are celebrating this week. And uh, these two great translators of this great writer's work are with us. And so uh, I'll cede the floor to David Bellows real quick. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> and thank you, Peter. <clears throat> um, you, you quoted Ismail Kader's own uh, comments on translation, which are quite fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, one thing you said, I wanted to sort of pick up and sort of throw back to everybody. Um, that Kennedy wanted to retain you know, the dark passages, um, that's to say the difficult passages, uh, the foggy bits, I might call them, of uh, Aeschylus. Um, and I mean, this is a general problem for translation, uh, especially for literary translation. Uh, when you're reading, as it were, in your own language, uh, you often skip the foggy bits, uh, the difficult bits, uh, those that don't quite cohere. Um, 
but as a translator, a translators, at least by contemporary convention, are not allowed to do that. Um, you have to clarify uh, the norms of English language translation, at least, are, are those of clarification, and that your, your editor will, will, will uh, put a big red line through something that doesn't actually make perfectly clear sense, since we have this cultural predisposition towards simplicity and clarity. Um, uh, but it, it, I think only a great writer with the self-confidence of Cadere could actually talk about leaving some of it a bit obscure. Uh, most of us, if we did leave something a bit obscure, would have our knuckles wrapped or our wrists slapped. Um, uh, but it, I mean, it's a genuine problem. It's something that you don't understand, you can't translate, right? And to the extent you've understood something, you can say it more or less clearly. So to, to preserve a kind of fogginess about the text is really a very difficult act to, to, to pull off. And actually, I, I wanted to also quickly add to that. Uh, this, besides this, this dramatic recreation for Cadere as well, and I think for us as translators, uh, making the language richer uh, is something important. Will pointed it out. It's not what's lost, it's what's gained. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so Cad Cadore's uh, Orestaya mm -hmm. in Albanian brings gifts to Albanian, even though as a, as a host, he, as an Albanian host, he will shower his guest with gifts, but the guest does come bringing, you know, gifts mm -hmm. and, and very important ones. Um, Something else that makes Kadare very interesting uh, in, in Albanian as well is, is the fact that he's a language smith. Uh, when I was translating three uh, Gengadzibar Kosovan, three, three black songs for Kosovo, three funeral songs for Kosovo, three Urges. Urges for Kosovo, uh, all, all those years ago, uh, we didn't have an internet, so I would do my list of words, uh, strange words, and then I would walk over to the New York Public Library in 42nd Street and looked them up and they wouldn't be there. So then started the conversation with Albanian uh, speakers who, mother tongue speakers. In some cases, our own language, Iberisht, which comes out of 12th century Albanian and has gone in its own direction, has, is quite a conservative language. So it, it, it in fact helps. And I think Kadare also with his southern, southern dialect from Dirokast, from, from, from the, the town he's from, when you hear him speak and when you, you see his writing, there is that Tosk, which is mm -hmm. a Southern Albanian, uh, which is closer to the way we speak. Now, our language is different. Alberisht is maybe like Dutch is to German, Alberisht mm -hmm. to, to Albanian. But, uh, but sometimes I suppose if, if you come across a strange word in, in, a, in a Luther translation that you don't understand in German, you might find it somewhere in Dutch. I don't know, I'm just saying. So, so it goes both ways. What we what we yeah. bring and make English richer by, by bringing these perspectives. Uh, we, uh, uh, a translator like Cadere has also given a lot to to um, to the Albanian language. And we see in in dictionaries when you look him up now on Google. Thank God we have that. Uh, mm -hmm. You find a word. It, it only exists in a dictionary. It's called a Cadereism. He's brought to the language. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> could I also? <clears throat> Um, engage with something David Shook said about the uh, extraordinarily powerful validating function of translation for the source language. Um, because it's, uh, it's not true only for, how should I say, little languages or small cultures. Um, uh, Cadere's works published in French you know, have a standard publisher's thing on the back, a, a blurb on the back, and it says, translated into 40 languages in big letters. Uh, even in France, which you might say is top language number two after English, it, it, it really means, it's really a validation uh, uh, of the status of the work that it has been translated. And so um, uh, I, I think this is, um, it, I mean, it, if, if you think of, your source is a guest in your house. Well, you are giving your guest a huge gift um, and a gift that is, um, if not a universal, a very wide currency simply by publishing a translation. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to the point you made. 
In English, we don't do it. In English, what do they say? It says the international bestseller. They never stop to think, what do you mean by international? Huh? Canada? Um, <laughs> uh, th th there, is, there is a, um, a willing blindness to the validating function of translation in the English speaking, amongst English speaking publishers. And I, I hope Deep Vellum thinks of doing something a little bit different and say. <laughs> I, I love that point. And I do want to say, I have put international bestseller on the back of one book, but it was mm -hmm. almost an inside joke because the book was translated from Icelandic. Right. And it was the best selling book in Iceland that year that was not a crime novel. And it sold 10,000 copies, which in the US okay. would not make it a bestseller. Okay. But in that Iceland, country, yeah, yeah, a yeah. significant percentage of the population. Like that's, yeah. it, that's the equivalent of like a dozen million copies here in English. Yeah. Like it was incredible. Um, so I put it on the back of that one book. But as a small publisher in the US, we are victims of um, market forces that are controlled much bigger than us, right? The big five, as we call them, the, the major New York publishing houses, they control 90% of what's published in America. They control the distribution chains. They control what's in stores. They control what's on Amazon's front page. And uh, they used to, once upon a time, uh, publish most of the translations and they don't need more at all. They publish a minority of the translations now. And so it is smaller houses like Deep Vellum or Amazon Crossing that continue to publish a majority of the translations, which is a shame for writers like Cadere, who, you know, he has his relationships going back, but the future Cadere's of Albanian or in French. Yeah. The unique thing is that no matter how small the language in the world, uh -huh. the same market forces are applying with how hard it is to get translated into English. So yeah. every country I go to the world, they say, I wish we had more of our authors in English. And I say, and they say that in France, they say it in Germany, they say it in Spain. And then you're like, yeah, try being from the Isthmus Zapotec language, try being from Welsh, try being mm -hmm. from, you know, Korean. It's, it's hard for everybody, yeah. unfortunately. And so- and it, it, it is extraordinary that that should be the case when nearly all of what you call the big five are in fact not American companies. They belong to Bertelsmann AG, which is a family company in Berlin, and to Holzbrink, which is a family property in Stuttgart. And most of American publishing does not belong to Americans. And you would have thought that given that they are international uh, and foreign owned, they would at least be aware of translation, but it, it somehow hasn't trickled down. The culture hasn't trickled down with the money. Maybe it will, but it hasn't yet. Yeah, and another great point is that uh, one of the other uh, of the big five is a French company, uh, Hachette. Yeah, so, Hachette, um, that's right, yeah, which is, the big five they, they, they make, they make uh, airplanes, La Gardère. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I actually think there was a great question um, that was just asked by Sandra Smith um, in the comments. Thank you for asking. And again, if anyone has questions, drop them in the comments. Sandra's question um, relates a little bit to this question of bringing in the role of publishers and translators, which is a relationship. I will say as a publisher, um, I often have much closer relationships with my translators than with my authors because there is this bridge going on there. But Sandra's fantastic question is, uh, what is the role of the editor in the translation process, especially when the editor does not speak the language that's being translated from? Do Can I, any of you speak a little bit to uh, your relationship with editors and making sure that this, this, I guess, brings up the bigger question of foreignizing and domesticity of translations, which is something we've all read about in translation theory. But um, uh, would anyone like to jump first, raise the hand? Well, I, I talk too much, but I could tell you lots of stories. <laughs> How about one story to start us off or David Shook first and then back to David Bellows. I, I don't know that I have any particularly uh, humorous stories in mind. I think it, it is, of course, a, a conversation. I think it's, it's really wonderful to work with an editor who has some experience translating. I think that makes a, a world of difference. And I think that's one of the things that makes you a good editor, Will, as a translator from the Russian. Um, I... I think it's it's difficult. I, I do recall in in that novel or really novella I mentioned that that we published translated from the Lingala. Halfway through, it breaks into this 
call and response song that these two young lovers are singing at a bustling bar in the middle of Kinshasa. And it's this bizarre mix of, uh, it's bizarre to me, it's not bizarre, in fact, <laughs> but to me it was a very new mix of, of the oral tradition and these kind of traditional so songs of, of romance that are part of traditional Congolese courtship rituals, but with all of these very contemporary images. Um, I, I love you. I would, um, I would give up an entire UN airplane full of food for you type of thing. And it was a big question to me, how much to preserve that as it was. Mm. And ultimately, we, we did preserve it as it was. That was a, a novel that was incredibly difficult to find a translator for because I, I acquired it without a translator. I'd, I'd read a partial translation into French and I had talked to a few Congolese friends who were interpreters to commission some samples and was not super pleased with the results and ultimately wound up talking to the Congolese publisher who is based in Belgium and he and his wife wound up co-translating it. English is her third language I think and his fifth and it it turned out remarkably well but ultimately what we did with those those songs was try to use the formatting of the book and um, to kind of represent visually what was happening and how these were being sung back and forth. And I, I don't know to what degree we succeeded, although I, I think it was a success to retain these, these back and forth songs. If if only because they are so distinct and, and so different. And to me, what was the point of publishing a translation from the Lingala if we didn't reflect what it really was? I, uh, I, I want to admit to something. I don't know if this is a sin here in this Alta talk, but thank you again to Alta for hosting and sponsoring this panel and to all the great work of all the translators out there. But as a publisher, I have uh, worked with editors before and um, I've edited many translation and I have asked an editor before to edit uh, a translation so that it a quote unquote doesn't read like a translation. I used those terms. How often have we heard those terms? And of course the translators I was working with in those instances were not, they were earlier stage translators and were a little less confident in their own output, but this brings up the creative writing aspect of translation too. And so how editing plays into working with translators and developing the language of the author for some sort of mutually agreed to intended effect. David Bellows, do you have a good story for us? I have to say that <clears throat> I respect my copy editors and line editors very much, those I've worked with these last 30 years. Uh, many of them seem to me quite remarkable people in that they are not themselves writers or translators, but somehow have this gift for seeing how to tweak and adjust. I think it's particularly important to have good relations with your editors because uh, English language books are copy edited and books published in many other languages are not. French books are not copy edited. They have a, 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 a kind of um, uh, almost comical simulation of it with what's called la toilette du manuscrit, but basically they publish what the author gives them and that's that. Um, so th their books, even if they were being fr published in French in New York, would need copy editing to conform to our uh, book production standards. So copy editing a translation from French into English is also somewhat editing the original, uh, at least the extent of a certain amount of repetition or uh, mistakes or type. I mean, you know, they're, they're not well edited by our standards. So uh, copy editors are marvelous people. Um, uh, I, I, and uh, no, I don't have any funny stories. I have any stories of 
a, a fruitful cooperation. And I don't think it's, for me anyway, I, I don't mind or particularly want my copy editor, uh, my line editor or copy editor uh, to know the original because I know the original, I know what it means. Um, it's, it's what it sounds like to somebody who doesn't know the original that actually matters uh, in terms of producing a convincing work. And I'm afraid on the um, academic uh, soccer pitch uh, with um, uh, foreignizers in the blue shirts and um, uh, uh, domesticators in the white shirts. Um, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the white shirts. Um, I, I don't think it is actually intellectually uh, uh, or morally uh, realistic uh, possible uh, to say, I'm going to write this in English so that it sounds foreign. I mean, I think that's, I think it is a, it's a delusion. Um, uh, it just sounds bad. Uh, unless you know what foreign language it is attempting to mimic. Yeah, I mean, you know when something translated from German sounds a bit German because you know elementary things about the German language. But that's cheating. That's actually part of the English language imagination of what German sounds like. That's not really foreign. In fact, it's only when it's actually native that you can make it sound foreign. So, end of my little bleat. <laughs> um, so, no, I think we should use our editors and publishers uh, 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 to assist us in producing books that work in English or work as best as they can in English. I, I love that story, David. It reminds me of my very first day training to be an editor slash publisher with Chad Post of Open Letter Books. And I'm sure we all know Chad Post of Open Letter Books. And Chad has this particular way of wording things so brilliantly. And on day one, uh, I said, Chad, what am I doing today? Uh, how to teach me, teach me. And he said, all right, great. Edit this book. And he put a printout on my desk. And I said, uh, okay. I mean, what are the rules for editing? He goes, do you know how to fucking read fucking write down anything that seems weird in the fucking text and then give it back to me. And I said, Oh, okay. And this was a very well-known translator. We are all good friends with. And as I was reading through the translation, I mean, it was just the, you know, commas here and there. I, I just marked them. But on one particular story, and this was from a language I have zero familiarity with, not a semblance of an idea of what this language is constructed like. I read, the, I read one of the stories in there and the first word of it came back to me as I finished reading the story. I said, it seems like that word should be, there's like a mirroring between the beginning and the end of the story. So I circled the word at the beginning of the story. But anyways, he packaged the edit, sent them off to the translator who wrote back that night horrified that they had mistranslated the first word of the book. I didn't know a word of the language, but as an editor, you can, you can see the way that things are supposed to work when you're working in tandem with a translator, right? That's when it works well. It's not how the sentences are constructed because they, they built sentences well. They worked in English, but sometimes yeah. even a mistranslation, which happens so rarely, but people ask about it. It does time, happen, yeah. It, it, you, can, you pick up on it because things don't ring yeah, outside of it. Yeah. when you're reading it yeah. on the editorial level, which is very different than when you're reading as a reader. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted to bridge that. And then this next question that... Um, is is a, a really good one. I do want to say David Shook just responded to a question in the chat. And so I know we're not going to be able to get to every question. We only have 14 minutes left. But this next question for Alana, because I think it's really um, interesting, is when you're working with a foreign text, this is a question for all of us, but let's start with Alana. How do you, if at all, maintain any sense of foreignness in the translation so that we don't erase the language or the culture or the context that it's being translated from. This is something that interests me deeply as a publisher as well as, as a reader. I was laughing as you all were talking about um, how, do you, how do you work with editors who are pushing you toward clarity or simplicity? How do you preserve the fogginess? And I was laughing because I've actually had to do that the opposite direction. So I've actually had to defend the fogginess to the poets I translate. Um, so actually, um, the the Dictionary of Midnight, Abdullah Pasho, the poet, the poet of that book, um, speaks Kurdish, English, Russian, and Arabic. He's translated Pushkin from Russian to Kurdish, 
Whitman from English to Kurdish. He's, he's an incredible translator himself. Um, and uh, so as, as I was translating, we had the fortunate and very unfortunate relationship of being able to um, discuss the translations I was making in great detail. And one of the moments that he, he you know, Kurdish is a language of pictures. Um, if you can say, English says confess, Kurdish says stomp or tread on your teeth. English says forgive, Kurdish says get your hand off my neck. Mm -hmm. um, English says you disappoint me, Kurdish says you're breaking my hands. So it's this very bodily um, imagistic language. And one of the moments, and, and so Pesho and I had been having these very good natured fights back and forth. He calls me mishmash, I call him pishpash. So he'd be like, mishmash, it is, that is not what we're doing here. And I'd be like, pishpash, it is beautiful in the English, I promise you. And, uh, and then finally we got to this moment where it was um, the, a, a branch in the mouth of a black wind. And it was, you know, the book is 500 pages. It was, you know, 400 pages into this. And he finally broke out and he said, Marusha, it is not, it is not in the mouth of a black wind. It is in front of a strong wind. And I said, Pishpash, that is a terrible English phrase. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, this sort of preserving the fogginess is, is um, when I think about it in Kurdish, I always think about how to, the texture, the texture and beauty of those images, the texture and beauty of, of um, if you could hear Kurdish as a child, if you could hear it as a, as a in its very smallest pieces, um, how, could you, how could you give English readers the sense of that? And, and it really, it's quite idiosyncratic for me. Um, and I'm grateful that I have for the most part translated poetry because I think poetry can sustain a lot more of that imagistic strangeness um, more easily. It can happen in fiction, it can happen in prose and nonfiction, but it's, it's a little harder to defend. Um, so that's, that's what I was thinking about as we were talking about that, that fogginess, that, that sense of um, linguistic specificity and, and quality, because um, it's a big discussion between not just me and my editors, but me and, and the poets I translate too. Yeah, I wonder, Peter, could you comment on that? You also translate from so many different languages. I'm curious to know sort of your experience here. Sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself, but I think what Alana just said is extremely interesting. Uh, uh, David and I were talking about that last week. The fact that, that as uh, translators into English, we are extremely vulnerable because the whole world speaks English. And uh, one thing that our, our editors, uh, let's say at Norton or Modern Library, Random House, uh, often do is that they're shields, that they, they keep them away. Because the thing is that, um, and maybe that sounded a bit harsh, I, I, I have also very good relationships with certain, certain poets and, and, and writers who I've translated, and that's absolutely a wonderful experience because then you can speak and ask, uh, you know, what's behind the words, what's behind your thoughts. But, the problem is, is that um, if, if a German author or a Greek author who is very comfortable in chatting away in, in English feels that it is like they have a mother tongue feel and are editing you, what then happens is they try to edit out, uh, um, well, they want their word order maybe, you know, in German we have clause after clause after clause after clause and then a verb. I've had authors who demanded that, ich hab das so geschrieben, that's how I wrote it, yeah? Und es muss so, auf, that's how I want it also in, in English, it's, mm. it's my text. I wrote it in German. It has to be this way. So there, there is that which can be pretty dangerous. And I, I I'm very thankful to to uh, my editors of the last thirty years, you know, who've who've done that. And as a translator into modern Greek, which I've been doing a lot in the last couple of years, I don't have that problem at all um, because the um, the yeah, one uh, target audience, yeah. Mm. Yeah, they, they, uh, so I'm, I'm translating an Afrikaans uh, a poet, uh, Ilse van Staden, who is a fabulous poet, I find, into Greek. Uh, I've also sent her English translations, and I will say she's a great poet to work with, but, but she can't comment on my Greek. In fact, this is why I also sent her the, the, the English versions, which were supposed to be just cribs, just say, well, this is what I would be doing in Greek. Um, 
And in fact, uh, well, I, in fact, uh, you know, I, I sent them to Daniel Simon. I think we might be publishing them, even though they were initially not meant to be like that. But so Ilza will comment on the English, but can't comment on the Greek. That's something that uh, that uh, I think is an interesting element here from an editorial and from a translator's perspective. We could be invaded by the author and that can cause problems. <laughs> I should say, yeah. Uh, could I come in here to something that Will said about the the question of how do you preserve the foreignness of the translated text. Um, I'll stick my neck out. I don't think translators uh, have any business preserving the foreignness. I mean, if you want to preserve the foreignness, teach people the original language. Then, I mean, uh, 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 what we're doing is producing English versions of these foreign texts. Um, I'm reading a, uh, a book, uh, a wonderful little story translated from Canada, which is a language of Bangalore, uh, uh, called um, Gacha Gocha in English. I do recommend it, incidentally. And in it, a family uh, buys umbrellas when they come into money. Um, it's a story of a family that gets richer. Uh, uh, they buy the umbrellas to protect themselves from the moonlight. It's because nobody knows what to do with an umbrella in Bangalore. Yep. Uh, and uh, so they, they buy these toys. Now, that's foreign. Uh, that's preserved. That, that's part of the work. Yeah. And as a translator, you wouldn't have to make any effort to preserve it. Um, so I, th I think there is a misconception, a, a, a misapprehension. It, it's the, the, you're bringing into English what the work is, and that is the important thing. And that, that thing contains uh, things familiar, things unfamiliar, things new, uh, um, uh, things bizarre. Um, but at the level of the language, I don't think I'm in the business of preserving the foreignness. But maybe that's because I work from French, which, after all, is virtually English anyway. I mean, you know, the, the foreignness of French is not very exciting. Um, um, uh, and, and maybe those of you who translate from uh, really very different languages have a different take on this. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know whether, you know, knowing that this turn of phrase is Zapotec, adds anything to reading a Zapotec work. What I want to read is a Zapotec work. Um, you know, uh, so there you are. That's, that, that's my perhaps rather extreme view of this. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> this, this question of maintaining foreignness is one that we could do a whole other panel on. And so for anyone who is interested in the topics, please do read David's book, but then also um, you could write to any of our panelists, drop your email in the chat or, or contact any of us separately. Our, our emails are all on the internet, but uh, these questions are really fascinating. And so well, I have like a speed dating answer thing because we had a couple of really interesting questions come in. We have five minutes left, so let's go fast. And the first one, Alana, um, and I'm, then I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, the question was, what was the first piece that you translated? Um, and then how did you go from there? And I think then to, this is a great question for those who may be interested in literary translation and how to get into it. How did you pick a text? How did you start and then how did you grow? Very quick and then maybe we'll be able to wrap up from there. I'll do this quickly because I also responded a bit in the text. Um, I, the only way to start is to start. And that is the most awful, awful, awful thing to say to someone who hasn't yet started. Um, but it, it is the only real answer, I think. I started with a text that was impossibly difficult. I should never have started there. If I knew anything about Kurdish literature when I started translating, I would never have started with that text. And that text was enormously instructive for me. And I spent six years really learning who that author was. And the, that single author, that single poem is the reason I went and did a PhD in Kurdish literature from the 19th century. Um, so the only way to begin is to begin, um, pick a point that excites you, that interests you. And then in Kurdish, they say, which means like one thing comes from another. You're just following the thread down the rabbit hole. And as soon as you start, you'll, you'll again, it's a terrible thing to say because you can't see what comes after the thing, the first thing, but after the mountain, there's always another mountain. So climb the first one and you'll see the whole range behind it. Yeah. Does that answer the question, Will? Ab absolutely. And there was a secondary question in there that I was trying to mix them together, which is like, how, yeah. how would you encourage translation to young adults or those who are bilingual and interested? And so I feel like your question is great 
that's my experience as well. Um, I, I had been taught in undergrad that translation was something done by gurus, essentially who sat on mountains. Don't get into translation, only read things in the original. Tran this is a very Russian thing to do, by the way, the Russian literary theorists to say, don't you dare translate. Don't even touch Russian literature with your dirty, filthy little pen. And, and uh, when I got to grad school, I was asking my professor, I mentioned Carol Apollonia, I said, why isn't this book, this one particular book in English? And she said, oh, let me tell you. And that's when I first heard these sort of things about the 3% problem, that less than 3% of the books translated are published in America every year are, are translated from other languages. And so with her encouragement, I dove into a relatively short novel, but still a novel. And I did it for fun, not realizing at the time I could have done it for my master's degree project. Instead, I did something else entirely. But um, I do think that starting with something you're passionate about, and for me, I was very passionate about this novel, and so it was very fun to do, even in my free time. Peter, what, do you have anything you teach to your students or any advice you could give about how you got started? Well, I started when I was in, actually, the very first translation, I was 17, but let's say when I was in my early 20s, and, and what I was very interested in was, was uh, people of my age group writing in in Dutch was my first language actually of translation. Uh, so I want a little bit of, of, of distance. Um, um, German being my mother tongue, even though I grew up in Greece, but anyway, that's a long story. But so uh, uh, Dutch and, and modern Greek. Uh, and what, what happened was I, as Elena said, just start. And I did, translated it, then put it aside and read it as if it were an English text, as if it were, were handed in by, by a friend who's English isn't that good because usually a first draft of a translation does sound like that because you're a bit too close maybe. So edit it, edit it, edit it um, so that it sounds like the Dutch does or like the Greek does. Um, then I sent it out to literary magazines and back, back in those days you put it in an envelope, you uh, had a self-stamped, self-addressed stamped envelope, you put it in and that turned into a little bit of a cottage industry thing. Today it's easier with submittable because you can put it, put, put it up on a submittable um, um, online, each magazine has its submittable um, submission manager, and uh, I would I would just say work on that. Of course, contact the writer, get permissions, because that's important. Many many people at the beginning of, of their careers aren't really aware of that. So find somebody you like, ask them whether you may translate them, translate them, see to it that it's beautifully beautifully done, I mean, beautifully edited by yourself, maybe by friends, if you want to get a second opinion, send it out, do more and more. And then it, it is amazing how that can can flower out into, into a, well, a major new, a major new beginning, you know, for yourself as, a, as, a, as somebody working with literature. So those beginnings ended up in 30 years of, of, of doing, you know, complete works of Babel, Chekhov, Dostoevsky, you know, various things like that, just from that thing that Elena said, just start it, just start it and go on, you know, do it, so. If, if they're not gonna immediately shut us off, da David Shuck, thank you so much, Peter. How'd you get your start in translation, David Shuck? Well, I was fortunate to grow up in, in that space between languages and cultures in Latin America to, to Texans. And I, my first translations, I, I must have been, they were just, just for me, really. Uh, they were of a book, from a book of Octavio Paz um, collected works that I bought at a Sanborns uh, restaurant in Mexico State. And I was probably 14 or 15, but I didn't really know literary translation was a thing that it existed until until college and I was fortunate um, I was I was an intern at world literature today and that really gave me a, a bit of insight into the profession of literary translation and also to that idea that you know if there was something you really liked why not give it a go and I think finding Finding untranslated authors who are enthusiastic about the translation of their work can be very encouraging and empowering. I think submitting to, to magazines and hearing back from editors, uh, the ones that, that will comment on your work is, is really helpful. And I think 
translators are, are remarkably approachable for the most part. Alta is a great example of that, and their annual conference is a great place to begin. I very highly recommend it to anyone interested in getting involved in translation. And, and lastly, David Bellos, or would you like to offer your grand unified theory of translation, wrapping it all up? Perhaps not the GUT. <laughs> No, I just answered the question. In 1981, somebody gave me a copy of Perec's Life of User's Manual in French, which I took home, read, and stayed in bed for three days. I was so overwhelmed by it. Uh, and I felt this is a book that could be in English, ought to be in English. I want this book to be in English. Um, I would not advise anybody else to start the same way. Um, I mean, it's a huge, 800 pages. That was my first translation. That's how I got into it. And it's been downhill all the way ever since. Um, uh, second, what would I do to encourage young people to go into translation? I wouldn't. I think there are many young people who want to get in translation, too many. Um, we are not, that's not the problem. We're not short of gifted, talented uh, 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 young people um, uh, learning many languages and wanting to translate. I think our efforts should rather be towards opening up more opportunities for them to get their work published. Um, uh, so that's my answer to those questions. David Bellos, thank you. David Shook, thank you. Peter Constantine, thank you. Lana Marie Levinson Labrosse, thank you. Uh, we have brought up a lot of big issues and David closed it with something that of course is near and dear to my heart, which is what we can all do to share translations. We need more publishers of translated literature, but more ways to find readers. We need more readers of translated literature, serious literature broadly. And to that end, we want to thank World Literature Today for all they do to bring great translations to the world for publishers like me to read, for readers like you to read, um, and to give an avenue for these wonderful translators that their stuff read, to the New Stop Prize, and to Alta, the membership organization we need uh, to help us go. And so thank you all for joining us. Uh, and thank you again to Nancy, Naomi Carlson and Alta for hosting and sponsoring this presentation. And uh, we hope to see you out there in, in the land of readers. Thank you again, everyone for joining.